We got it hot. Y'all can hear me. We can go now? <laughs> We're here. All right. Yeah. Philip, we need to turn down, turn turn the AC down a little bit, make it cooler in here for you. I think so. We'll get that done in a moment. <laughs> well, good morning. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will resume our study in the second chapter of the book of Daniel. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit will uh, loosen our hearts the words that you would have us hear. Uh, that we might be able to apply it to our lives as we live as light into a dark world. Um, we pray a special blessing upon those that are traveling, those that uh, uh, have taken ill. We, um, we know that you are the great physician, Lord. Uh, please pay, place your healing hand upon them, and those that are traveling, return them here safely home. Uh, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. We will return to the uh, second chapter of the uh, book of Daniel as we begin to study the cornerstone of uh, end times prophecy, uh, the, the decoder ring, if you will, uh, of, of how to understand the, the, the sweep of human history. Um, uh, last week, we, we got ourselves right up to the throne room of Nebuchadnezzar himself, okay, as Daniel is standing in front of uh, the, the, uh, the king in his uh, insomniatic state, all disheveled, um, very uh, agitated and whatnot. Uh, I'd like to pick up uh, from uh, verse 29, but uh, before we do that, just a reminder of, of um, uh, how, to, uh, how a Christian can behave in times of utter chaos and crisis. Uh, obviously, we know that Nebuchadnezzar, in this case, had issued a decree that all of the wise men uh, of Babylon, the province of Babylon, were to be killed and their homes turned into dung heaps. Um, and even in the spite of that degree of threat, Daniel uh, did um, five things that I think are applicable to our lives as we live for Christ in a time of crisis. Number one, he remained composed. I also wrote down the word calm. There's a lot of C words involved here. Uh, but uh, he did not let his parasympathetic nervous system, his reptilian brain, take over. Okay, he remained calm and confident, and that's the second one. He was confident. He was not confident in himself. He was not confident in his plan. He was confident in the grace gift that he had been given uh, by God, which we saw in uh, chapter 1, verse 17, the ability to interpret and understand dreams and visions. So he was composed. He was confident. And third, he had confidants in prayer. Remember, he goes back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they bend knee and give uh, thanks to, uh, to God Almighty um, to, uh, for, for revealing uh, the mystery uh, to, to them. So he had a community of prayer. The fourth thing is he had compassion. If you'll recall, he told the king's executioner, don't go executing people. The king had told the, the, the Arioch, go execute him. Daniel says, don't go execute him. And what did Arioch do? He did not execute him. Okay? So Daniel, this he Hebrew youth, is giving instructions in compassion uh, to the uh, captains of the king's guard responsible for carrying out the decree to kill all of the wise men of, of the province, province of, of Babylon. And the fifth thing was Daniel exercised humility. When he stands in front of the king, he says, it is not because of anything or anything that I am or anything that I have done that God has revealed this, uh, this dream to me. It's because God gave the dream to you and he wants you to understand uh, what is going to happen in the end days. So I'd like to start from verse uh, 29, and we will read through uh, verse, um, uh, let's go with 35. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 29. As for you, O king, while you were on your bed, your thoughts turned to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man. 
but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. Verse 31, you, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time. Don't overlook that. And became like chaff from the summer threshing floors and the wind carrying them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, when Daniel was standing in front of the king, he had, the, the, remember what the challenge was? The challenge was twofold. First, it was to declare to the king what the king had dreamed. Tell me what I dreamed. The second thing was, tell me what that dream means. And Daniel throws in a little appetizer, okay? He says, not only has God revealed to me your dream and what the dream means, God revealed to me your state of mind when you got the dream. Now, up to this point, I mean, we, we're conditioned because many of us have read this scripture and over and over. We know that what we're going to be talking about is the sweep of human history in the end times. But realize up to this point, Nebuchadnezzar hasn't told anybody the, the, even the context of this dream. He could have been dreaming about the ghost of Christmas past. Okay? And present and future. He could have been dreaming that, you know, maybe he was wandering uh, with, with only his underwear on at his high school reunion. And what does that mean? Okay? And that would have been disturbing to him. I'm not so sure it would have caused him to be an insomniac, but realize he hasn't given any clue as to the context of this dream whatsoever. He could have been dreaming anything. Okay? And Daniel stands confidently in front of him and declares the dream, declares the interpretation of the dream, and tells him what the king was thinking about before he put his head down and received these dreams. So what we will see, and we started this last week, is a sweep of human history from this part, point in, in time in the 6th century B.C., until the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I made the, the contention yet, uh, last week that you can teach all relevant human history from this passage of Scripture right here. But as I mentioned last week, you then couldn't charge tuition for a full semester or two semesters, so you don't really get, you don't really get that, that, that option. But Daniel is about to deliver prophetic news to the king of Babylon that includes the fact that his kingdom will go down. That's, that's some tough news that he's going to deliver. Okay. So some things to note from, from verses 31 uh, through, uh, through 36 or so. It is a single statue. There's a replica of it for you to look at. Tori has handouts that she's been passing out. Um, if you don't have one, um, uh, you can... We'll, you, Go back to where, uh, towards the back, and we'll, we'll give you one after the, uh, uh, after this, the Sunday school period. But it's, it's a single statue. It is one statue. You're going to see different kingdoms in here, okay? But the elements form one unit, okay? There's not two or three statues or four statues standing independently. This is human history in its totality. Also note that the word is used there, it is, the appearance was awesome. That word is phoboros. Does that conjure up any thoughts in your mind as to any, any type of, if you were going to try to maybe conjugate uh, that verb or, or 
it, what, what, what do you think it, it stands for? Phob phoboros. Sound like anything? Phobia. That's exactly right. It is inspiring fear. It is terrible. It is formidable. It is frightful. Now I look at it and I go, hmm, not so frightening to me, okay? Um, but that's not it, realize. Uh, the, the, the appearance of this thing was absolutely magnificent, rocked Nebuchadnezzar to his core. And it did so, I think, not only by, by the appearance of this image, and by the way, it's labeled as an image, um, but because he knew what he was thinking, what he was worried about when he went to bed, right? And this is what came to him. So he knows somebody's trying to tell him something. Okay, and he also now knows that none of his conjurers and his sorcerers and his magicians can even come close to it. It is standing. It is standing up. Okay, it is towering. And then also note that it ends suddenly. It does not disintegrate gradually. It gets struck by a stone cut out not by human hands, and there is complete destruction of this statue. Now that, we, see, I don't think we spend enough time when we study this talking about the destruction of the statue. You know, we get into the, okay, this is Babylon, this is Medo-Persia, this is Greece, and this is Rome, and stuff like that. We don't spend enough time, I don't think, talking about the stone, the stone that destroys. Not only does it destroy, it says that the shaft is carried away um, on the wind without a trace left. This means it's ball game. It is over. There is no residual. There is no residue that even remains once this stone crushes this statue by striking it on its feet and setting up a mountain that fills the entire earth. The stone in my opinion, is the all-important, all-encompassing aspect of this dream. It is the ultimate victor, it is the hero, and it is that which upon eternal destinies are built. So we're going to look a little bit at this stone cut out without hands. What this means is that the stone is of supernatural origin and destiny. Nature, as we know it, had no role whatsoever in creating or propelling this stone at this statue. Exodus 20.25, okay, you don't have to turn there. Exodus 20.25 makes, I think, an interesting statement. We'll start, I'll start in 24. You shall make an altar of earth for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. Listen to verse 25. If you make an altar of stone for me, this is instructions to the Israelites, you shall not build it of cut stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. See, when the Israelites were building altars of stone, they had to gather stones as they were. They were not to work them, to make them into some type of work of art, lest their handicraft be the one that receives the glory. These were rudimentary altars that they were taught. They said, if you start cutting on it, if you start applying that chisel to it, that's human endeavor, and you profane the altar. The King James Version, I, I read from you the New American Standard. The King James Version, I think, is, is a beautiful uh, 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 text in, on verse 25. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. This stone is untouched by human hands. So, 
that leads us to the great question. What, or maybe more appropriately, who is this stone that becomes a mountain that covers the entire earth? And I think you know who we're talking about here. Okay, We're talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Genesis 49, 24 says, But this bow remained firm, and his arms were agile. From the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, from there there is a shepherd, the stone of Israel. That's the Messiah. Matthew 21, verses 42 through 44, this is after the triumphal entry uh, into Jerusalem, which we will see in great detail, by the way, in the book of Daniel. This is Passion Week stuff in front of the chief priests and the Pharisees. Some of your translations may say the priests and the elders. Starting in verse 42 of Matthew 21 says, Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures? <laughs> you like that? I, I mean, I go back to my days of teaching history and sometimes of actually coaching sales. Did you not read the textbook? The answer to that is generally no, okay? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Did you not read that? Chief priests, Pharisees. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Jesus is the dividing line. Your decision for or against him determines your destiny. So we've seen the words of Christ. We have seen Old Testament. Let's look at what one of the apostles has to say. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. And coming to him as a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will never be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they are appointed. We'll go back to the prophets now. Isaiah 8, 14. Then he shall become a sanctuary. But to both the houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Your decision for or against the Messiah determines eternal destiny. And he's coming in judgment. Isaiah 28, verse 16, Therefore thus says the Lord God, that's a pretty good author, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. It is from that text that you begin to see the quotations in the New Testament. Okay? But look at that. A costly cornerstone. For those who say our gospel is cheap because we have to do nothing other than accept it, I say it is the ultimate cost. And Jesus Christ paid it. Reverend Schofield actually sees three applications for this stone. Number one, the stone to Israel comes as a servant, a stumbling stone, a rock that leads to fall falling, the test, the test of the Messiah. The second one, the stone to the church, is the foundation stone. 
the headstone. We are his bride. And thirdly, the stone to the Gentile world's powers is a striking stone. And that's what you see here in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now, I could go on and on and on about the stone, okay? I haven't even talked about Moses speaking to a rock and striking a rock yet. We could go on and on, but do we get the idea? We know who this stone is. So we can do this by acclamation. All in favor. I would like to conclude this section on the stone, though, uh, by um, uh, looking at what's called a psalm of Solomon, okay, the reign of the righteous king. If that's not a psalm that you have earmarked in your scripture, I would say it, it's very, very worthy. It's Psalms chapter se or Psalm 72. I'll start in verse 18, just two verses. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone works wonders, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and may the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And what does this stone grow to? A mountain that fills the entire earth. This prayer is going to be fulfilled in the second coming of Jesus Christ. But now we turn our attention to the interpretation. You now know what the dream is. And I want to remind you that this dream was given first to a pagan king. It was not given to a Pharisee. It was not given to a Sadducee. Not given to the chief priest. Not even given to the, the Hebrew uh, youth first. It came to the pagan king. So we pick up in verse 36 of chapter 2. This was the dream. Now we will tell you its interpretation before the king. You okay? Okay. Let's stop there for just a moment. At this point, Nebuchadnezzar leaps from his throne and says, you got it. Is that what it says? That's not what it says at all. Does Daniel ask in sales we have things called a checking question to make sure we're singing on the same song sheet, sneezing in the same Kleenex, you know? We check in to see, are we tracking okay together, Okay. You even see, you pastors and teachers, are we all right? I've done it a couple times already today, okay? Are we good? Does Daniel do that? No, he doesn't. He doesn't do that at all. That was your dream. Well, I, now, I have, I have Nebuchadnezzar here pictured with his jaw hitting the floor, okay? Stunned silence, okay? I don't see him leaping up. I see him going... Ariok was right. He brought to me the one person who can reveal the dream. But Daniel doesn't even check in. Now, if he'd have been off at all at this point, the king would have probably been furious. But he had it down perfectly because it was the perfect revealed word of God. You, O king, verse 37 are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the strength and the glory, and wherever the sons of men dwell or the beasts of the field or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them. You are the head of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar leaps from the throne. Yes, I knew it. I knew I was the head of gold. No, it doesn't say he does that. That's what I've been doing. Yes, I'm the head of gold. <laughs> <clears throat> we'll see him do a little bit of that, by the way, in chapter 3, okay? Doesn't hear anything. We don't hear anything from the king. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you. Yes, I'm the greatest. Doesn't say it. Then another kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. In verse 40, there will be a fourth kingdom. As strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks into pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces, in that you saw the feet and the toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. But it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and some of it will be brittle, and in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay. You're getting a theme here. 
iron mixed with clay all over the place in this. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay. They will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. So he's gotten you all the way down now to the feet that have the toes. Okay? He's brought you from the head all the way to the feet. But remember, you haven't seen the stone yet in the interpretation. That starts in verse 44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will be not left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will in itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Now you saw, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story okay so let's look at this interpretation Daniel already knew it was true had confidence in it Babylon is the head of gold Nebuchadnezzar as the supreme monarch of Babylonia is the head of gold and note here God gifted I like to call it do you think when he was in high school they called him Chad that's a long name, okay? I could see him, we're going to call you Chad. No, I want to be Nebu, because Nebu was actually the God portion of that. But Nebuchadnezzar, that's a long name. But God gifted King Nebu the kingdom, and he granted him dominion over it. He declared, God declared him to be the king of kings. Now, mind you, that's the king of earthly kings, Okay? king of kings in terms of the capital letter K is reserved for the stone okay but he is sovereign over the earthly kings but will be no match no matter where he is on this statue for the stone that is to come now we are approaching um, the festivities of fall uh, some people refer to tomorrow as Halloween that is is fine we won't we won't deal with that uh, today but um, there is a, a, a word that is used in Scripture. It's a name, okay? You can look at it. We won't spend a whole lot of time, but it's a name that has special meaning, actually, uh, for, um, for this particular part of the season that, 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 that we're in right now. And the word, the name is Ichabod. Did you know that comes out of Scripture? Ichabod Crane, yeah. And Tori is cringing because we are going to go see tonight at 9 o'clock the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Okay, in downtown Granby. She really is excited about that. My choice. <laughs> Ichabod has been proclaimed over Jerusalem. Do you know what the word Ichabod means? By the way, it's pretty appropriate for Ichabod Crane, if you know the, the Washington Irving story. It means the glory has departed. The glory has departed. And it is a name in Scripture. Okay? We'll look at a, I'll look at it for you in a, vi a vision that is recorded in Ezekiel 10. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the temple, and the temple was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. That was verse 4 of Ezekiel 10 in, the, in his vision. And then in verse 18 it says, The glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple. The glory of the Lord moved away from the threshold of the temple. See, from here on out in human history, okay, Jerusalem and the Hebrew people themselves will be ruled over in some way, form, or fashion by Gentile nations. It's going to continue that way until the end of time. It's true to this day. Is there a temple on the mount? There is not. Does Israel owe its existence to the protection of Gentile nations. Yes, it does. Since the days of Harry Truman in 1948. Does Israel occupy the totality of the land that is promised to them in their covenantal relationship with God? Not even close. Not even close. 
So Ichabod had been proclaimed. But why gold? Why gold for Babylon? Okay? It's pretty easy to go, well, look, gold, silver, bronze, you know, now you can hear the Olympic theme playing in the background, you know. It's like we, we get that, that part. But there's some really special meanings, guys, here behind these metals. Okay? So why gold for, 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 for Babylon? Herodotus, commonly referred to as the father of history, reported that he had never on earth, and remember, he traveled. He traveled everywhere. Okay, that's why he's the father of history. He recorded, he was almost like a journalist type historian of his day. Okay? He came to Babylon, I think, 90 years after the, uh, after the beginning of the Persian kingdom. Okay? But he said he'd never on earth seen such an abundance of gold that was in Babylon. Temples, altars, vessels, all made from solid gold. Listen to this. In this temple of Babylon is another chapel down below in which is seen a, a great gold statue representing the seated Jove. Now, Jove would have been a god. In fact, Jove would eventually become uh, known as Jupiter, okay, once you get on into to mythology a little later, okay. Close to the statue, there is a great gold table. The throne and the dais are of the same metal. That would be gold. The whole, according to the Chaldeans, weighs 800 gold talents. Outside of the chapel is seen a gold altar on which only suckling lambs were sacrificed. There was moreover in those days within the sacred area a statue of massive gold whose height was 12 cubits. I have not seen it and only report what the Chaldeans tell about it. Nebuchadnezzar, that's Herodotus, Nebuchadnezzar himself talks about a temple that he actually commissioned. And yeah, now you're into the part of human history where we actually have documents and artifacts and cuneiforms, okay? We actually have them. They sit in museums, okay, that are being studied even to this day. So Nebuchadnezzar himself describes a temple. The house that I caused to be made for gazings and for the multitudes of people. Do you see that? This is a temple that he built, but why did he build it? It says it right here. The house that I caused to be made for gazings and for the multitudes of the people. Does that sound like something that is elevating and worshiping a god? Doesn't sound like it to me. Okay, it's for gazings. Okay, it says, the awe of power. This is his words, guys. Okay, the dread of splendors of sovereignty. Okay, that's why he had this thing commissioned. It sides to be girthed in gold. The walls were made of gold. Okay, from a cuneiform uh, cylinder that is currently in the Penn Museum in Philadelphia. This is what they discovered about boats that were made out of gold and paraded up and down the Euphrates River, okay, in celebration of their pantheon of gods. Here, here's what, this is actually in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, words. I adorn the boat Udura on which rides the lord of the gods Marduk. So this is the boat dedicated to Marduk. Its front and its rear, its upper structure, its sides, its deck, post, and dragons with 14 talents, 12 minas of shining gold, 750 pieces of marble, its bright lapis luzili, and on the surface of the clear Euphrates, I let the, him shine splendid like the stars in heaven, and I filled with jewels and the admiration of the people. I covered the cabin of the boat of the Ganul Canal, the boat of Nabu, and also both sides with 13 talents, 13 minas of shining gold. This dude was into gold. What's that? Did it float? That would have been embarrassing. On this boat rides Marduk, the great folk. I'm sure they'd have figured out something. Okay. Now listen to what the museum. Okay, that, that was never, that's an actual trans, translation from the, the cylinder itself. Okay. Listen to what the museum uh, has to say about it. Now this is a this is not a religious museum. Okay. One of the finest, and for several reasons, a unique document of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has been preserved in the University Museum for over 35 years, but never entirely deciphered. And yet its description of the gorgeous temples of Marduk and Nabu and of the splendid furniture, especially of their state boats adorned with gold and precious stones, is of great interest. Get this. And strangely like the story of the prophet Daniel. Strangely. Strangely like the story of the prophet Daniel. That is strange that God would get human history correct, <laughs> okay? See, gold is very important to the Chaldeans. It was important not only for their commerce it was and their currency, it was important for their ego, and it was important for their false worship. But why the head? Why do they get to be the head, 
Okay. Well, this is the only part of the statue you see that is one singular entity. Okay. They are at the top of the Gentile food pyramid. Okay. Also realize this. Nebuchadnezzar, and to a lesser extent, this degrades throughout their kingdom, which didn't last long. In fact, if you, if you know history, it lasted between 70 and 80 years. How many years were the, is, uh, the, the Israelites in captivity? 70 years. The whole reason for this thing to even exist is for God to have judgment on the people who had forsaken him. Okay? But this king, Nebuchadnezzar, had absolute monarchy. What he says goes. This would not be true of future kings like under the Medes and the Persians. Okay? We know this because all we needed to study, and we'll get there, is Daniel in the lion's den. The king could not take back the decree. Well, in Nebuchadnezzar's situation in Babylon, what he says goes. The law was done. The king was the law. This will not be the case further on. The next kingdom we see, and this I'm going to confess already, I'm going to geek out on you a little bit, okay? And you're going, you haven't already done that? Yeah. Well, this is one I think we skip over too much, okay? Because if we'll notice in the interpretation, it doesn't give a whole lot. But the next one we have is called the, the, the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, in, in, in uh, secular world history, it's sometimes called the Achaemenid Empire. So if you see Achaemenid Empire, that's the, the, the kingdom of, of Medo-Persia. It reached its most stable point under the rule of Darius I, uh, also known as the Great, right? I mean, if you're going to be a king, you might as well be the Great, right? Uh, whose son Xerxes, who is one of my wife's favorite because she likes the movie 300, um, Xerxes would tr attempt to bring the Greek uh, city-states under control, and that would put him uh, in opposition to the Hellenistic uh, 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 part of the world. Uh, but it extended from the Greek city-states to Egypt to North India and virtually everything in between, including Central Asia. Okay? That's the one that would follow. Okay? It says in verse 39, And after you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, and then, what? And then another... And then another kingdom of bronze. Okay, we just flat out just whistled right past that next, the, the Medo-Persian Empire. You see that? That was quick. Bam. And then there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another kingdom. Okay? He didn't spend much time here. Okay? You notice he doesn't spend much time. And I think that is purposeful. Because if Nebuchadnezzar who knows everything about, who do you think he's going to be most interested? I'm the head of gold, right? Yes, I'm the head of gold. I am really not interested in that feet thing right now. I'm really interested in what comes next, okay? And Daniel is, I think, attempting by his, his, his brevity here to, to say, hey, the whole thing is important. I got to get you to the stone. I got to get you to the stone, okay? But Medo-Persian Empire, and I'm going to cheat a little bit uh, uh, ethnologically here. Okay, because this is not very pure, but this is the way you can think of it. The Medes, you can kind of think of the Kurdish people. Okay? And the Persians, you can think kind of as the Iranians. Okay? That is way too simple. Okay? But we're going to suffice it you know, for, for this point. That's almost like saying, um, are all Italians Romans? Okay? It's a little too simple, but that gives you an idea who we're dealing with here. So... Daniel very quickly moves through from the Medo-Persian Empire, which is described as, as inferior, which actually means lower down in terms of towards the earth. It's the breast and arms of silver. Note that the two arms here, okay, are united by the torso. So what brings them together is the torso, okay? The two arms are Medo Media and Persia. Never did Media rule independently of Persia. Never. That did not happen in history. Media had been an ally of Babylon in its war against Assyria. The Medes were very good at aligning with people and overthrowing kingdoms, but they really had no aspiration of rule themselves. At this time, Persia was just a bunch of warring tribes, okay, going on down there in the land of Iran. They were just little bitty clans and stuff like that, um, you know, going after each other. Uh, I, just a little minor province in, in all of Babylon, which I think is really ironic 
Because guess what Babylon had been? A little minor pro province in the whole of Assyria. Okay? But it's going to rise. But why silver? Why silver? Often we stop here, I think, because we can just say, well, silver is inferior, less valuable than gold. Okay? And we can move on. But wait, there's more. This is the geek part. I'm going to read to you some, some research from 1948 and from 2022, okay? Because silver was exceptionally important to the Medo-Persian Empire and was important in bringing, down, bringing about its downfall, okay? I start first in 1948 from Professor of Oriental History at the University of Chicago, A.T. Olmsted, who wrote probably the seminal work called the history of the Persian Empire in 1948 he says after its last revolt Babylonia had been joined to Assyria that's his last revolt against Medo-Persia by the way had been joined to Assyria and its identity had been lost its silver payment was the highest in the empire at a thousand talents while its humiliating gift consisted of 500 boys to be made into eunuchs so see taxation happened there. That's how the Medo-Persian Empire uh, uh, established its dominance was through tra taxation. Herodotus tells us that in his day, when Tritonachemes, I hope that's right, held the satrapy, it gave him a daily artaba of silver per day, silver per day, okay, to the satrap of Medo-Persia, 12 gallons, 12 gallons of silver per day given to their provincial governor. It was the custom to melt down the gold and silver and to pour it into jars which were then broken and the bullion stored. Only a small portion was ever coined and then usually for the purchase of foreign soldiers or foreign statesmen. Thus, despite the precious metals newly mined, the empire was rapidly drained of its silver. They hoarded silver. They brought it in, they put it in clays, they, they, they basically buried it in their backyard, okay? They had a lust for silver. Now, I want you to note, some of these, uh, some of these people, these foreign mercenaries, were the Greek hoplites. That will come into play in human history. For a time, credit was made possible to continue businesses, but the demand for actual silver and the payment of taxes drove the landowners in increasing numbers to loan sharks who gave money in exchange for the pledge. So, in other words... You drain the economy of silver, okay? You can't pay your taxes. You have to go to loan sharks. Loan sharks say, I'll give you the silver, but you've got to give me use of your land. As coined money became a rarity hoarded by the loan sharks, credit increased inflation. What? There was inflation in ancient Near East? Apparently so. And rapidly rising prices made the situation still more intolerable. So here, here's, here's how it happens. Their pledged lands, meanwhile, were worked by the loan sharks for their own advantage until title was completely lost to the original owners. When additional fields reverted to the state, uh-oh, what? The state confiscated the, the land. And guess what the state did? It says right here. They actually leased it back to the corrupt, uh, the corrupt officials, leased it back to the loan sharks. The inevitable result was that the whole period is filled by stories of revolts by oppressed subjects. Good thing we don't have that happening today. In March 22 of this year, there was an article written called Origin and Fate of the Greatest Accumulation of Silver in Ancient History. <laughs> you like that title? Origin and Fate of the Greatest Accumulation of Silver in Ancient History in Archaeological and Anthropological Sciences of Volume 14, March of this year. The Achaemenids ruling of old Persia achieved the largest accumulation of precious metals reported in ancient history, equivalent to about 5,000 metric tons of silver. If tribute was an efficient way of drawing off silver accumulated by potential adversaries such as Egypt and Ionian Greece, long-distance trade was the long arm of this scheme certainly cheaper and less risky than launching distant military campaigns. Basically, they taxed their provinces so heavy they couldn't afford standing armies to actually wage war against them. 
considering that much coveted Greek hoplites were usually paid in silver. What? They actually are training foreign mercenaries who would eventually, yes, Tori, in the, in the movie 300, become the Spartans. Okay? But eventually the system of storage of very large amounts of silver in the royal vaults, whether intentional or not, contributed to the collapse of the Persian Empire and ushered in its replacement by the Hellenistic kingdoms of Antigonid Macedonia, that's Greece. Why silver? They had a lust for silver. That's how they controlled their empire. And they hoarded it, and they created first deflation, and then inflation, and by the way, had to pay foreign mercenaries, some of whom were the Greek hoplites, who would eventually take over that kingdom under a fella named Jimmy the Greek. That's not right. Alexander the Great. Not the mediocre Alexander the Great. We're going to stop there. So we're halfway down the statue. Next week we get to see the brazen Greeks. We also get to see the Iron Romans. And then we will uh, begin, I think, uh, one of the most instructive portions of, of this is talking about those, those feet and toes. Um, and uh, I've got a little bit uh, in here on uh, the hermeneutical approach to, to interpretation of Scripture because it's very important that we get this part correct because that will define when we see the stone. Any questions? Is that too geeky? I love that silver story. I just really like it. I'm not a big fan of silver because every time I go to the dentist, they say, your silver filling is cracking your tooth. I'm like, well, then why would you do it in the first place? Okay, I don't, I don't get that. But uh, any questions on this one? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are in total control of history. We thank you that we can live in peace with Jesus Christ because he came to, to make that sacrifice on our behalf, and we know it's a cost beyond anything that we can possibly comprehend. We thank you for the word of God, uh, both revealed and incarnate. Help us to stay in relationship to your word, uh, that it might be a light into our feet. We pray a special blessing on this service that will follow. We stand on your promise that we're two or more gathered in your name. There you will be also, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.